With fundamental questions like the new frugality now raised, we assemble our own panel of wise men to give us the benefit of their experience. Joining me today is Tom Stevens, former vice president of Loblaws and president of Brand Strategy Consultants. Next, Jim Wisner, former vice president of Topco and now a successful retailing consultant. And last but certainly not least, Jay Forbes, retired publisher of Drugstore News. Gentlemen, well, let's talk about skew reduction. How far do you think that retailers <coughs> are going to go with that? A long way. Why? With 45,000 SKUs in a supermarket, mm -hmm. of which 40% don't sell, there has to be massive reduction in SKUs. Now, you know, I'm, I'm based in Canada and travel internationally. We have an average of about 10,000 SKUs less per supermarket in Canada to what, what we have in the U.S. But has it always been like that? For a long time it's okay. been like that. Mm -hmm. So when you do walk into a Canadian store after you've been in a US store, you think there's a lot less selection. But at the end of the day, if, if 30, 40% doesn't sell in the US environment, and we know from what we've learned from Walmart, what we've learned from Aldi, what we've learned from many chains, that efficiency of assortment is a huge, has a huge impact on margin, then those 45,000 SKUs, there's 10 or 15,000 of them that have got a very limited lifespan. Yeah, I, th I think Tom is absolutely right, because if you walk in, for example, a Loblaws in in mm -hmm. uh, Canada, or you go to some of the stores in the UK, what you walk away with a first impression is really a sense of that there is as much variety in terms of product choices, but there's considerably less maybe in terms of multiple sizes or the 25th mm -hmm. flavor or whatever it may be. And as the retailers begin to, begin to attack things from a skew rationalization standpoint, not only is it interesting, do they get more efficient, but what are they going to do with the backfill? And where the backfill is going is really two places. One is certainly to private label, and particularly mm -hmm. with the growth of premium private label, that now allows them to put products on the shelf that really are different and aren't duplicated and are unique to that chain. But the other place we're seeing some growth as well, which has really been intriguing, is we're seeing specialty foods is holding up very mm -hmm. well. Right. Because that provides, I can only buy this item right here. It is unique, and if you Absolutely. lose this item, Good point. I'm going to go to another store. Mm -hmm. If you lose these things that are relatively undifferentiated, it's fine. I'll buy something else on the shelf. So is this, uh, and I'll play devil's advocate for a second, you know, you're talking about Great Britain, you're talking about Canada. In America, I like to have all kinds of different brands on the shelves, and if mm -hmm. I don't have those, then I think there's something wrong with the supermarket. How are the retailers going to change that perception? Well, Jody, you don't buy them all. You no, may no. like the no, choice. No, but I like to know that it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you do. But if, if we took 10,000 out of an average American supermarket, you wouldn't notice the difference. Mm -hmm. You would not because a lot of products you don't see because there is you know, half a space That's for true. each product at the end mm -hmm. of the day in most stores. So by taking out 10,000 mm -hmm. SKUs, you're not going to miss anything. Yeah, Jody, it, it, in, in years past, um, in order to gain increased share of market, a lot of branded manufacturers extended product in, in sizes mm -hmm. and multiples. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of uh, product that wasn't earning its way off shelf. And I agree with Tom and Jim. Those the, the, the difficulty is to try to get the right mix of private label and brand as we go forward. Um, I remember when Loblaws back in the 60s went to black and white packaging. Mm -hmm. like That's how generic, far back. The old the generic, generic packaging. Absolutely. And, and, and brands in the United States, chains in the United States followed suit and they took out very well established, good branded product and put in black and white equivalents. So what you had was out of stocks on, on products that people were looking for in demand and you had theoretically high margin products standing there but had no currency with the, with the consumer and so gathered dust and there had to be a readjustment. And I fear that what's going on today is happening in, in many ways in the United States are following that, that, that same pattern. Um, I know that in many cases supermarkets are up to over 30% of their front end in, in private label today. Mm -hmm. And uh, drug chains say they average at 15, but you can go into CVS or Walgreen and you have to seek the brand because the look-alike private label is being promoted, more SKUs side by side at a cheaper price in virtually every area of the store. And the labels are bigger on the, the shelf <laughs> yes. talkers are a lot bigger. And the shelf talkers are bigger. And now that we're talking about private brands, which, if any, or which ones, which categories do you see the greatest growth coming in, in private brands? 
I just what categories? To, I just want to, mm -hmm. before answering that question, touch on the fact that the data shows us that the consumer is more and more satisfied with a private label purchase. Mm -hmm. So by giving more space to private label, not doing it just crazily as they did back in the mm -hmm. 70s, and I agree with you, Jay, no question. It went completely overboard and very poor quality products, and the consumers are not stupid. They see huge displays of poor quality products in very boring packaging. They're not going to come back, and that's what happened in the U.S. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Canada went a completely different route, and in Canada, the generics became known as good value and good quality products. Mm -hmm. So different story. But right now we have growing acceptance in the U.S. by the consumer of private label, yes. great satisfaction with the products, increased perception of value right across the board. So I think generally categories across the board are going to show the potential for growth as long as the retailers stick with quality and with innovation. Now, there's not much innovation in commodities, clearly. But as long as the quality is there in the commodities, the sales and the penetration of those will grow. In terms of the actual categories that are going to grow, I think wellness, I think fresh, I think mm -hmm. products that consumers are going to cook at home. There seems to be a resurgence of family meals. Yes. And I think all of that, that all of the, the, the media <coughs> noise about that is going to force us, force our consumers to be going in looking for products they can take home and cook. So stuff that they can use, stuff that's going to improve wellness and, and well-being, all of that, strong potential. What about the big brands? Do you think they have a chance to come back after the recession? The short answer is not like they were before. But you've been, uh, never uh, the, been the, known for a short answer, but, but the, well, the <laughs> <laughs> Jody, the environment's changed. I mean, if you look at how brands got established in the United States versus other countries where we had commercial television, and you could reach an entire marketplace very easily and control the message, and if you will, pull people into the store to get the brand, that, if you will, balance of power has all shifted because the media is fragmented, it's very expensive, and to a great extent, the only way many of these manufacturers can begin to build their brand sales is by diverting monies from actually building the brand, and mm -hmm. Tom knows all about right. this, to now spending that money on trade marketing. Mm -hmm. So what's happened is now you are a brand who is attempting to compete on the basis of price against somebody who has an advantage. And it's, it's a little bit like somebody compared it to a duel once. And if you were an expert swordsman and I was an expert marksman, you don't want to choose guns as the weapon. Um, right. And so that's a little bit what's going on with some of the national brands. They can feed it for a while, uh, but what happens over time is that, you know, that emotional content and that emotional contact that they have with their customers begins to really go away a little bit. And then it, it's, now they're just a higher price, not as good alternative. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I agree with Jim's opening statement that- uh, What, the short answer is no? The short answer, <laughs> the short answer is that they can come back to some extent mm -hmm. and selectively, depending on which manufacturer you're talking about. And I'll tell you why. Um, I think that the, the alternative media that is being created right now gives them an opportunity uh, to go in different directions and target. Um, they are able to, uh, to use uh, digital means, uh, viral uh, means of, of getting their, their message out. Videos certainly have been a big part, selective targeted videos, uh, and even their own website, selling their own product over their own website. And contests, and, like look at Doritos and, at the Super Bowl, uh -huh. the six commercials and, and that the they marketing. And, 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 and new marketing and new ways of going about it. But what I do think will happen is the days of having, uh, if you're not, a no, uh, let me back up, if you're not a number one or number two player in that marketplace, your days are extremely limited. So that's because interesting. The interesting. Because private that's label is good. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Tom? No, no question. We are becoming more and more aware of, of choices. We're having more negative documentary films airing, which tell right. us that the food right. chain is not as good as we might have thought it was. Yes. That, that kind of issue. We're having recalls of major branded products in the, in the uh, OTC areas, not just in the motor car, auto okay. industry. So there's lots of opportunities for customers to say, no, those brands that I've always bought, you know, the third, fourth, fifth brands maybe, no, I'm going to go for the better alternative. So uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Jay is right. One and two may still be there, but three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, and I can count past ten if I have to in, a, in an American supermarket, then, then their days are numbered for sure, and they're not going to have the funds. They're not going to be able to compete in all of the alternative media that you talk about. It's an extremely expensive thing to compete in alternative media, so as very well as it used to be in commercial television. 